Great. Well, welcome everybody. This is our really great to have everyone here together today for our ADA leadership chats. This is actually our uh, fifth fifth one that we've had this uh, since yes. since the summer. Uh, it's a great collaboration with uh, Nick Pad Lakeshore, Disability and Sport, um, Nafapa and Ifapa, kind of all coming together to have conversations, um, emerging leaders, uh, bringing in you know, uh, legendary leaders like Dr. Rimmer, all great people that are able to share the latest and greatest. Um, so without further ado, I'm gonna hand it over to, uh, to Bob Ohana with Nick Pad and Lakeshore um, to kind of welcome folks and do a proper introduction uh, for Dr. Rimmer. So over to you, Bob, and thank you all for joining us today. Thank you, Eli, and uh, Merry Christmas season's greetings and happy Hanukkah to all our listeners and uh, just, just thank you for this time and for joining us again. And uh, well, uh, Eli hit it best. He, he, this man's legendary uh, and not that it's, it's over. It's still a legendary career in progress. Uh, Dr. Jim Rimmer uh, started out in Bronx, New York in 1981, dedicated the majority of his life to uh, inclusion and, and disability issues. and. Um, Currently, he's uh, the Lakeshore Foundation Endowed Chair in Health Promotions and Rehabilitation Services at the University of Alabama, Birmingham. Uh, he's also Director of Research at Lakeshore Foundation and uh, founder of NICPAD, which has been very important to my life and, uh, and just come up with a lot of innovative ideas and creations that have really promoted uh, the benefit of many people with disabilities. And the man serves as, as very much a role model to many of his colleagues and, and people around the world. So without further ado, uh, Dr. Jim Rimmer. Well, thank you, everyone. And it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, before we jumped on the Zoom meeting, I, I, I told Eli and Bob, you know, when you use the term legendary, it makes me feel old, you know, like a legend in their own time. Most people are dead when they're, when they're spoken about as a legendary person. But fortunately, I'm still alive, you know, and I'm I, uh, uh, very excited to be here today. And I'll try to- Living legend, living possible. legend. Possible. Okay. Living legend, yes. <laughs> Living legend, <laughs> thank you. Uh, so what I want to do is today is, uh, uh, Bob is part of our new project, which is funded through NICPAD, and we call it the Mentor Program. And for probably the last two decades of my career, I've really tried to think about how can we build out what we do so well in exercise, recreation, and sport, you know, into something that would be um, a bit broader from the standpoint of wellness. And so I've spent a lot of my career, uh, I actually started in 1981 teaching personal health classes at Manhattan College in the Riverdale uh, section of the Bronx um, and became very interested in, you know, understanding how to protect myself and those that I was actually working with at the time, people with disabilities, young individuals with disabilities at Manhattan College. So this whole area of wellness, you know, as you know, has, has gotten a lot of uh, feedback lately because of the COVID-19 pandemic. But I think it's a good topic for us to think about because as experts and specialists in exercise, recreation, and sport, you know, we do a lot of tremendous uh, work and have great benefits to people with disabilities. But I think there's also a dimension of this, if we could pull that layer back of exercise and look at wellness from a broader perspective, that's what MENT is kind of about, is really thinking about other things that one could be doing in order to promote, self-manage their own health. So that's what MENT is all about. We were very fortunate to get a supplement through NICPAD a couple of years ago, and we're actually now running the program uh, at five facilities, Shirley Ryan Ability Lab in Chicago, uh, the Spalding program up in Boston at where Eli is at with, with Dr. Blauet, Ali Riley and others. Um, we also have it at the Shepherd Center in Atlanta, at Spain Rehab here in um, Birmingham and of course, Craig Hospital. So we really got a nice dream team of rehab centers that are now focusing on how can they sort of infuse wellness into their patient care program so that on the back end of patient care, when a participant leaves the doctor's office, they have a greater understanding of the breadth and scope of what they could be doing in their personal life in order to promote wellness. So, you know, for many years now, I've used this graph, uh, you know, from the perspective of going from rehab to wellness. And as we all know, when you have an event, 
it even could be something like a heart attack for an individual that doesn't have a disability. When you enter the healthcare system, there's a preponderance of emphasis on surgery, uh, diagnosis, and medication management. And so for a number of years, I've been trying to look at this issue is how, how, do, how do we begin to infuse what we do so well, exercise, sport, recreation, but also other elements of wellness into the healthcare system. And of course, having two, two daughters who are therapists, one is an occupational therapist in Denver at a, at a hospital called Spalding Hospital without the U, and the other one is a speech pathologist, you know, they, they, they were telling me for a number of years now that they see this real gap, that they would love to do things in health promotion and wellness, but, you know, they're really on the clock. They're only going to be reimbursed for acute or chronic rehabilitation, and they can't do these things. So we need to begin to think about this gap that we see very often after a patient leaves the hospital setting, and then they start to slowly decline because they're not getting connected you know, to the kinds of things that we're doing. So sometimes that could be done through wellness, and sometimes it has to be done just through exercise, depending on what the individual's interest is. But if you think about the demographics, right, if we look at, well, we have a, a little over 60 million people with disabilities, and then you look at the percentage of people who are engaged in exercise, you know, we have to ask ourselves the question, is this the best approach to begin with and to only suggest to someone that, you can help them start or participate in some sort of exercise. So wellness has to be the back end of rehabilitation and the back end of wellness really be, mean, needs to be, you know, something related to exercise. So the goal here for us as a profession in this 30th year of the Americans with Disabilities Act, where we've done so much from the architectural standpoint, you know, we, we have better transportation systems now, they're not perfect, but they're much better than they were 30 years ago. You know, people can get into work settings, you know, and have removal of certain barriers at work. There are certain reasonable accommodations that can be made. We still struggle with the idea of accessible exercise equipment in fitness centers. That's one area that we need to continue to push to ADA. But I think we're now at a point where we need to begin to think about how do we empower people with disabilities with certain skills so they can promote their own health? So the scientific rationale behind this whole area of wellness is that when someone acquires a disability or they begin to think about um, having a condition like Parkinson's where they've got a new diagnosis, you know, they often remain as a rehabilitation patient. And what we're trying to do is really get them to understand that once they have that diagnosis, you know, they may go through a certain stage of feeling remorseful about having it, they need to move on and get into the area of wellness. And again, I, I think exercise is a wonderful portal for people with new diagnoses to get into something that's health promoting, but it may not be the only thing. Wellness is often impeded by a community that is underprepared to support health and wellness needs. So that's where, you know, Bob and our other expert information specialists have spent, you know, a, a tremendous amount of time with great success, trying to build out communities to make them more inclusive. We've got a wonderful program in Nick Pitt. If anybody's interested, they can contact Bob called the Inclusive Health Coalition. We need more inclusive health coalitions across the country. And certainly that's an important area of Nick Pitt. But what we're trying to do at Mentor is almost go, on, go to the opposite end of the spectrum. So Nick Pitt's focusing on the top three levels of the socio-ecological model, developing policies, looking at structures and systems to make sure they're inclusive, getting into communities and assessing communities with, with an instrument that we have called the Community Health Inclusion Index, and then also working with institutions and organizations to make their programs more accessible, like fitness centers. But the bottom two levels of the socio-ecological model are really the inter-individual relationships, relationships between family, friends, and the community, and then the individual relationships, right? How do they think about themselves in terms of an empowerment structure where they can begin to do things that will improve their health? So that's what Mentor is really trying to do is fill in the bottom two levels of the socio-ecological model. And then, of course, we're trying to connect to healthcare because when that person leaves the healthcare settings, we want them to, to understand that they can come to NICPAD and we can do two things. One, we can get them engaged in the community, which we've been doing for 22 years. 
or we could start a program in their home, particularly during COVID-19, using the Mentor Online Wellness Program, which you'll see in a minute. So now we, we think we've got both ends covered. And what we've been using in NICPAN is the term push-pull. What does that term mean? It means that we want to, the pull component of what we do in NICPAD is really the top three levels of the socio-ecological model, right? We want those policies that are inclusive. We want to build structures and systems like the school system and the healthcare system and the community fitness system. We want them to be inclusive. We want communities in general to have accessible streets and sidewalks, safe routes to school. So we continue to do that. But in the interim, what wellness and mentor are all about is really getting into where now we've got to begin to push the patient out of the home and turn them into a participant where they can do something in their community. So that's the push part of it is getting into the home, doing one-on-ones with participants, and then encouraging them to get out in their community to do something in the area of wellness. So I, you know, I won't have time to go through this today, but a paper I published about 10 years ago you know, really emphasizes that there are a lot of physical secondary conditions that we be, have to begin to think about in a more precision-based model. And that's why we think Mentor is such a, an intuitively sound program because what you can do is you can teach your therapist, you know, and you can work with your therapist on starting to address these issues in a hospital or rehabilitation setting. And then once they're discharged from the hospital or discharged from outpatient, they need to go to a place, you know, where they can continue to improve and recover for many of these secondary conditions that occur as a result of having a disability. So when we begin to think of exercise, which we do so well, we also have to think about what is exercise going to do to address these multiple secondary conditions. And you, know, you can see the bars in red of people with disabilities and in data that we could find on people without disabilities, you could see that there is these huge health disparities like chronic pain, for example. You know, there are many, many people with disabilities who live with chronic pain and as we know, as exercise professionals, if someone has chronic pain, they're much less likely to participate in exercise. So how do we begin to think about with them or others, how do they address these secondary conditions? How can they better manage them? And of course, you know, uh, what was interesting is I, was, I, I uh, finished a book a couple of months ago called Together, which was writ written by Vivek Murthy, who was the 19th Surgeon General of the United States. And I recently heard He's now going to be the 21st um, Surgeon General of the United States. So he's been re-invited by uh, President-elect Biden to return to that post. And I didn't know any of this prior to buying his book, but his book had a profound statement which really stuck with me. And this is what he said. He said, during my years caring for patients, the most common condition I saw was not heart disease or diabetes, it was loneliness. And I think, and this is just a hypothesis because I don't have a lot of data in front of me, but I, I, I do get a sense that the level of loneliness is strongly correlated to the lack of access to community-based programs. So if you have someone with a disability and they're in a power chair, right, and they're living at home and they have a personal care attendant, you know, the level of challenges associated with access to parks and recreation areas and, and, and accessible grocery stores that sell fresh foods, you know, is, is profoundly greater than it is in the general population. So part of what Dr. Murphy is saying is we've got to get, we've got to reach people where they're at. And that's the push concept of mentor, right? We've got to get into the home. And today we have a unique opportunity through Zoom to be able to do that. And this was a, uh, an actual graph that was published in New Mobility. By the way, if, if, if those of you who are on the call today are not aware of that, that magazine, this is a wonderful mag magazine for, if you're a professor, for your students to read. Um, it, it is um, you know, one of those that really focuses on the needs of people with, tip, with more commonly than not physical disabilities. And they did this survey in July 2020 during the COVID pandemic. And look what they found to be one of the greatest problems that people with disabilities were happen, having. Almost 80% of them felt like they were socially isolated. Now, again, this is not a, you know, a high level research study and we don't have comparative data on people who don't have disabilities, but just, you know, if you look at that number, 80%, that's pretty high. And there's probably a, you know, less of a likelihood of seeing 
you know, the disproportionate high rate like that among people who don't have disabilities. And of course, if you look at this next slide, isolation, as you can see, the third bar from the bottom is just like we saw just a you know, second ago, people with disabilities generally have much higher rates of isolation, okay, which then leads to loneliness, and loneliness leads to a lot of complications. So what we're trying to do in Mentor is, is transform patients into participants, and that's kind of the mantra we use, is when they're in the clinical setting, the hospital, the healthcare system, the therapy rooms, you know, it's okay to call people patients. You know, that's what they are. They are part of the medical system. They're a patient under a doctor. If you want to call them a client, that's fine as well. But once they leave that hospital, Mentor's all about saying, okay, now, you know, you're done with your healthcare, you're being discharged or you're ending in rehabilitation, you need to start to think about empowering yourself to be well. And wellness means that you now are a participant and you're driving the bus. That's what we mean by empowerment health. We lost, a, we lost an icon in the field uh, a couple of weeks ago. Dr. Margaret Nozick from Baylor passed away um, and they had a beautiful ceremony on Saturday through Zoom. You know, and her illustrious career was all about empowerment health. How do you get women with disabilities, you know, to be more proactive about managing their health? So, you know, these are the kind of things that those of you on the call, we need to begin to think about uh, in terms of building, you know, a wellness program that really meets the needs of a much larger community of people. Um, the other thing that we need to think about is, you know, wellness is, is, is really 1,440 minutes. And that exercise really only takes up a very small fraction of those 1,440 minutes. So if someone's having problems with rest, with sleep, you know, maybe they have something like restless leg syndrome and they have a spinal cord injury or that's a very common condition in people with multiple sclerosis, right? That's where you have to go with your wellness program, right? You have to begin to look at it that if they're not getting good sleep, quality sleep, if they're not sleeping at all in some cases, and I've heard people tell me, you know, they're up every hour in the hour, you know, that's, that's, that's an area that certainly would be supportive of the kind of work we do as part of the ADA 30. We need to think about, you know, being more precise in the prescriptions that we provide to people. So some of the mentor program highlights, mentor stands for mindfulness, exercise, nutrition, to optimize recovery and resilience. It has two parts. One is if the person is still in that recovery mode, which is typically about 24 months after acquiring a disability, we call that they're still in that recovery stage. Resilience is usually beyond 24 months, and that has a lot to do with adaptations that will improve their overall health and wellness. It's a holistic program. We're trying to make it precision-based. So what we're doing is we're collecting information uh, from participants to find out what they like, what they don't like, and then we're putting that into the system, you know, re-entering that into the, into the database. So the whole idea is what we call rinse and repeat which means it's not a top-down model where we create the program and people with disabilities use the information. We created a skeletal structure of the program. So we've got a little bit on mindfulness. We've got a lot on exercise. We've got some on nutrition. But the whole idea here is that's just kind of the, the base. And what we're asking people with disabilities to do, and we've got about 55 people now that have gone through the program, is we're asking them to drive the bus. You tell us what you liked about the program, what you didn't like about the program, and how you would change it. And when we get that information, then we're gonna put that back into the algorithms that we've created, and so that the next time somebody goes through the program, you know, they could put in these certain things, you know, certain um, uh, components, and then it'll come out with a more precision-based program. So that's kind of our journey. It's gonna take a while, but that's our journey in NICPIN, is to make it as precision-based as possible. And of course, that 3D model of health mind, body, and spirit, you know, again, it's exercise, also diet, it's learning to take care of themselves, self-care skills are taught, and then finally, rest and relaxation. And you'll see the graphic in a minute. So the whole idea is what we call restore, improve, prevent, right? Restore, you're in the hospital, you have a therapist, right? They're getting you back to a certain level of function where you can go out and you can do either semi or fully independent uh, activities of daily living or instrumental activities of daily living. But once you get through that point and you start to plateau as you saw in the graph, I think what we need to think about in ADA 30 is how do we start to develop a health coaching platform to get people to go from point A to point B. 
So this was created to empower stakeholders. This is really, you know, I, I want to emphasize, I cannot emphasize enough that what I want to see for Mentor is really an empowerment model. So if you could help me with that by getting people with disabilities to contact me or to contact Bob, I would love to talk to them about the program. I'd love to have them review it. I'd love them to participate in it. And I would love them to, to become a mentor coach. Mentor really means two things. One, we start mentoring you, but then we anticipate that you'll be the next mentor for someone else. And it, it doesn't have to be full time. It could be, I just want to be a peer mentor and I want to talk about my experiences with building strong relationships. Or I want to be a peer mentor and I want to help people, you know, get outdoors more in parks and recreation areas. Or I want them to self advocate, you know, so they can build more accessibility into their community. When I talk about mentor, it could be anything. And that's why we need the community of people with disabilities to really help us build it, you know, in a much more robust and dynamic way. And of course, many of you may know that the whole world of medicine, with genomics and behavioral science, it's all moving towards precision based. So we need precision exercise as well as precision wellness. And I'm just going to skip through some of these because we're really getting kind of long on time and I want to do open up opportunities for questions. But we do have 11 evidence-based wellness pro, uh, domains that are part of Mentor. And we've kind of formulated into this acronym called My Scorecard. And the idea of a My Scorecard is that the participant actually gets a scorecard, you know, just like if you were playing golf. And that scorecard, then they could look at where are they going high and low. So I'm in the final stages now of developing a wellness assessment. And I'm gonna post that wellness assessment online nationally and see if we can get people with disabilities to take it. So I'll certainly get it to you, Eli. And if anybody's interested in sharing it with their participants, we'd love to have people with and without disabilities fill out this wellness survey. It took me about a year or two to develop it, but it's a total of 16 questions uh, with three domains, physical, mental, and spiritual. And there are five questions in each of the domains. And then there's one overarching question. Because I do think as a profession, we need more information on wellness. What are people doing in the area of wellness? What do they need to do in order to optimize their health and well-being? And you can see there are little things here like relationships, you know? Who would think that relationships would be part of a wellness program? Well, you know, when you really start talk to some of the participants we've had in the program, relationships are the most challenging aspect of any of these domains. And you begin to ask them, well, what are, what are the issues with relationship? Well, it's just, you know, it's a relationship with their community that they're having trouble with. It's a relationship with, certain family members that they're having trouble with. It's a relationship issue because of the whole political dynamics now where some people, you know, are Republicans and some people are Democrats. So now there are relationship issues in, you know, in people's lives because of the political implications. So that whole training component of relationships, the chapter on relationships really focuses on how do you get people thinking much more broadly about building more positive relationships, you know, for the for for themselves so that they don't turn this you know, relationship into a bombastic situation where you know, you've got two egos fighting to win an argument. I mean, that's where things start to fall apart. So you could imagine how you know, exercise obviously being important, but if someone's really struggling with a relationship, particularly after an injury, you know, with a caregiver or a loved one, you know, this is where we need to begin as we start to think about wellness from the therapist to the trainer. And of course, Mentor's headquartered at Lakeshore. I think some of you know that. that's where Bob works. It's a great area. We've got a brand new facility that Bob's actually sitting in today. We just added on a uh, $17 million extension to the main building of Lakeshore, uh, which has a complete universally designed accessible uh, telehealth center now. And Lakeshore now has a new strategic plan where their mission statement is really to build more of what they're calling holistic wellness. So we really got it now because we've got resources behind us. You know, NICPED fortunately has been able to get to uh, providing resources for Mentor. And, um, you know, we, we hope that there'll be a point in time where maybe we could even host the ADA 30 at Lakeshore Foundation when we're done with COVID. So we're really excited about the future. So I just have a couple, a couple of the slides for those of you who are not familiar with Lakeshore. Uh, Lisa Hilborn is the director of the of the sports and fitness programs. He does a phenomenal job. She's an adapted physical activity professional. If you want any information on competitive sports, uh, anything related to starting a program, 
at your university, a wheelchair sports program. Uh, you know, Lisa Hilborn, who I believe is a member of your group, is that right? Okay, she could certainly help you with that. But we've got, you know, tremendous facilities, tremendous resources, and we've also got a phenomenal staff that knows, you know, everything and anything there is to know about exercise, recreation, sport. And now with this new extension and with this new strategic plan, you know, Lakeshore is really moving into training uh, some of their uh, staff in the, in the area of health coaching, wellness coaching. So we have about five or six people, Bob Lahano being one of the wellness coaches who will be, um, who are planning to use in the future as the numbers of people with disabilities start to grow. We have a brand new telenutrition lab, probably $300,000 worth of technology equipment so you could zoom in on certain foods. We have a full-time nutritionist, um, Lacey Gammon, so she could answer questions on the fly. We've had people at Spalding tell us, uh, a couple of participants, you know, they'd like to see an anti-inflammatory diet kind of a program, but we do online instruction in nutrition. So very important part of this. And then finally, um, just want to kind of summarize that and emphasize that, you know, really the concept of wellness is to emphasize self-care rather than expert care. So as I mentioned a few minutes ago, we don't want, you know, people with disabilities to think, oh, this is, you know, just another program that a professional is going to give me. We really want to empower them that they take over their own health and begin to self-manage it. And we're kind of on the, you know, uh, set, we're, we're kind of on the side stages, you know, supporting them in any way we can through Nick, Nick Pet and Mentor. So the whole idea is going from self-care. You certainly need that, uh, that, that, you know, that expert care initially, but ultimately it should be more about what can I do for myself. And then finally, you know, we just got a few outcomes that we try to hit in this first round of Mentor. We want to see increases in physical activity, healthy eating behaviors, reducing stress and anxiety through mindfulness, preventing certain issues in self-care. So we do, you know, we do teach people, you know, certain ways to make sure that they're okay with protecting their skin, or if they're having issues with a, you know, they think they might have a urinary tract infection. We don't necessarily have to be experts in this area, but we have experts who we can advise people to. So I want to conclude by saying in ADA 30, we're not asking you to become a specialist in any of these areas of wellness. What we want you to do is think about becoming a mental health coach, or if, you're, or if you're in higher education, think about offering a wellness for disabilities class. And in that class, what you're trying to do is make students aware of these elements or domains of wellness that they could be providing to people with disabilities in addition to exercise. So it's, it's really kind of, you know, we have specialists in certain areas. We have specialists in therapy. We have specialists in therapeutic recreation. We have specialists in exercise. But what we don't have is a generalist that can get people out of the blocks, you know, and provide some of these services, um, you know, it, it, at this very early level. If there are issues, you know, which could be either emotional or other things, you know, certainly they would have to be advised to other people. So with that, I'll stop there and turn it back over to uh, Eli. And again, thank Eli and Bob for, I really appreciate the invitation to uh, present today. Thank you. Uh, well, <clears throat> thank you, Dr. Jem. As always, uh, a wealth of information and, and uh, evidence-based information as well. So definitely appreciate the, that perspective. And uh, uh, I'm gonna start off in some questions and get some dialogue going. And uh, one of them comes from a, a colleague, uh, Jeff McCubin. And uh, I guess really one of the questions is in regards to mentor and really the objective uh, with mentor, as you pointed out, geared towards uh, the specific types of disabilities. His was a question in regards to uh, is mentor someone for someone with IDD or intellectual disability and um, it also just seems to be, uh, uh, you know, there seems to be a lot of people that may have a large part of the have these disabilities as well in, in regards to other disabilities so that's kind of a, the first question to start it off with and uh, so dr jim you uh, want to handle that one yeah and of course it, ha it, it would have to come from a dean you know a big shot like <laughs> jeff mccubbin as the first question he probably spent all night asking me and by the way he's as legendary as i am so when it comes to age we're kind of in that legendary group right jeff can't see you, but I can hear you. Uh, funny. So, Jeff, you bring up a great point. You know, um, we, 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 
unfortunately, the way our funding uh, has been provided to CDC, they've kind of dichotomized this, Jeff, into the Special Olympics and NICPAT. And they've made it kind of clear that the, you know, the, the key here is, you know, Special Olympics is more on the IDD side and Nick Pitt's more on the physical disability or neurological disability. Now, with mentors, since Special Olympics doesn't have anything, you know, I'm hoping that in the next five year funding round, which will begin in 2021, we haven't gotten our announcement yet, but Jeff, I would love to talk to you about this or to work with the IDD community because I do think that even all the work that Special Olympics is doing with promoting exercise and wellness, you know, there are probably gonna be gaps for people who live in you know, certain settings where they're not gonna have access to Special Olympics or they want something that's a bit more customized in one or more of these 11 wellness domains. So certainly that's a, that's a future goal, but at the current time, you know, we're really focusing on what CDC has mandated us to do and that is the physical neurological disability. All right, and thank you. And uh, we do have some other questions as well. I'm, I'm just going to throw one at you. Actually, it's more of a comment uh, to kind of uh, follow up with Dr. Jim in regards to, uh, you know, he's mentioned how mentor is kind of a twofold purpose of what they offer, but also wanting the people to be empowered. And the thing that just stood out is when you quoted Vivek Murthy about the, the loneliness. But one of the things that is an outcome of mentor, uh, and as a coach, I get to see this, is, is we have provided uh, somewhat of a, uh, I don't know if envoy is the right word, but uh, once a person has gone through the mentor program, they are now expected to be, to come back, uh, to provide service, to, to be someone that uh, a new mentor participant can, can talk with. Um, so it's really, it does serve that purpose and it is an outreach or an outcome of mentor. And uh, we're, I think we're on our fourth or fifth time with, with Mentor. Uh, so what's going to happen is this is just going to continue as we'll have more people be involved and be able to reach back, uh, you know, to be kind of an alumni, if you will, of Mentor participants that are going to be uh, very much key in us continuing to promote and, and serve people uh, with disabilities. So um, uh, we do have other questions as well. And uh, the next one here I'm reading. And, uh, um, it comes from, um, let's see, from uh, Emmanuel Felix, and he just basically wants to know, uh, can you address, Dr. Jim, the importance of yoga uh, as programs as part of the mentor program, and, 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 and do you have resources for practitioners who want to lead yoga for individuals with disabilities? Uh, if you want to handle it, Doc, you can. If, if not, I can too, but yeah, you're, the, you're the star here. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, and I know Manny real well. Manny was a student of mine, right, Manny, in 1987. So, wow, you know, where does time go, Manny? Uh, thank you for the question. We do have a yoga component. We have a we have a really very unique package of exercises, Manny, that include yoga, uh, Pilates, and what we call dual tasking exercise. Dual tasking are you know things that in the OT profession, as Dr. McCubbins knows, is the dean. At Colorado State, OT does a lot of these dual tasking where they have to do two things at the same time. So we've got this wonderful package of Pilates, yoga, and dual tasking exercises that are kind of compartmentalized for the health coaches. And there are seven, di six different levels, excuse me, six different levels that have been created um, in this package. So part of it is yoga, uh, part of it is Pilates, and part of it is dual tasking. Um, the other Thing that we have which I didn't mention today is we have a program called movement to music so the the health coaches are also trained to do a music based type of exercise program again it's not dance but it's enhancement of fitness using this very sophisticated program called movement to music and by the way if anybody's interested in this Manny or other people uh, just let Bob know you're interested in the yoga piece Tracy Tracy is the one who runs that yoga, Pilates, uh, dual tasking program. And if you're more interested in learning more about the movement to music program, that would be uh, Dr. Zoe Young, who's absolutely fantastic. They're both fantastic uh, specialists who could certainly assist you and explain what they do in those areas. Thank you. Very good. All right, we have more questions coming in, so so thank you very much. Keep them coming. Uh, next is a good colleague, uh, Lauren Lieberman, uh, Dr. Lauren Lieberman. Uh, 
She wants to know, Dr. Jim, if you think the Zoom exercise classes during this time of COVID has helped people to decrease their isolation and loneliness. Uh, yes, thank you, Lauren. And also, you know, these are all my, my friends, you know, my colleagues. So, so wonderful to hear from you. Uh, I don't get an opportunity, you know, I spend so much time, you know, working on the other side of the equation, the rehabilitation world that I don't get the chance to interact. But that's a great uh, point and that the answer is yes, that through Zoom, you know, we've actually been able to reach more people. Anecdotally, you know, the study, you know, the program hasn't ended yet for this first round of, of mentor that we're running at Spalding and some of the other places. But um, that's one question that I hope we get from participants is, you know, did they feel less isolated because they were more, um, you know, they had the opportunity, even through Zoom, to be able to interact with each other. I have to tell you that um, I'm, I'm preparing an NIH grant and part of it is to use this tele-rehabilitation platform that we created with another project um, funded under something called the Patient-Centered Outcomes Research Institute. And what I've been hearing in the literature, reading in the literature, and um, also things I've heard about uh, uh, certain reviews that I've been engaged in, is tele-rehabilitation, tele-exercise, it's, it's really here to stay that you know, the, even the medical community in, in the area of telemedicine has realized that you know, there are certain benefits that are occurring not having people come into hospitals. And, and, and one thing I read today, which was really interesting, is that you know, when people don't come into hospitals to get certain types of telemedicine care, you can't do it for you know, important things or urgent things, but certain things you can do on a telemedicine platform, you know, they have a lower risk of getting sick going into a hospital. So there's so many germs that the potential risk of infections, you know, goes up exponentially having people come into hospitals, especially if they're immunocompromised, like people with multiple sclerosis. So the word on the street is, at least at some of the federal agencies, and that's why this announcement came out at NIH, is that telemedicine, telerehab, telewellness is probably going to be with us for many years to come. It won't be either or. It'll be some kind of combination of the two. Thank you for the question. Yeah, very good, Dr. Jim. Yes, and then the questions keep coming. Uh, got a good one from uh, Doug Garner, Coach Doug Garner at the UTA. And he wants to ask Dr. Jim, is, um, any suggestions on what colleges can do to assist in the transition? Uh, we found that sports definitely helps in this transition. But I guess any other suggestions he's, he's, he's asking? Yeah, uh, you know, I... I um, when I was at Manhattan College uh, back in 1981, you know, the first thing I did as an adapted physical education professor is started an after-school program for children with disabilities in the New York City public school system. So I see a tremendous benefit, and I know many people on the call have done the same thing, Dr. Lieberman, Dr. McCubbin, uh, Dr. Felix, you know, all these programs around the country, you know, that are in higher education were created by professionals like us in adapted physical activity at the higher education level. What I think might be something we need to consider going forward with ADA 30 is how do we build better connectivity from those local community hospitals and big major urban center hospitals with the kinds of activities that we're doing um, you know, at the higher education level. Now you see this in exercise science, many programs around the country do have what they call phase three or phase four cardiac rehabilitation programs. But it, I think when it comes to somebody acquiring an injury, like a traumatic brain injury, or being diagnosed with a certain condition like Parkinson's, or even ALS, this is a great opportunity for you in higher education to reach out to your community healthcare providers. And maybe what you could think about doing is instead of developing just a generic inclusive health coalition, which is what we do at NICPA, you could develop an inclusive healthcare coalition and let the, and, you know, have the university, you know, take the lead in creating that, you know, in bridging that gap from rehabilitation uh, to wellness. So I think that's a major part of this is, you know, getting into your communities and then having them understand that we have the expertise in higher education to help them, just like we did many years ago when I took a position um, not only in New York, but when I went to Northern Illinois University, I was working with a very good colleague, Goth Timerson, and he had an outstanding Saturday morning program, you know, for families who had children with disabilities, as well as adults, 
And then he also started programs in the evening for adults with disabilities. And the second part of that response is that we've got the best and the greatest critical mass that we need to do this. And that is, we've got a wonderful, wonderful group of students who go into an area of science like exercise, recreation, sport, they can become health coaches. So I would encourage you to think about this today. And if you're interested, we could certainly even discuss your students, you know, taking this 20 hour online health coaching class that we offer. And then maybe, you know, as a professor, you could offer something in the area of wellness and disability uh, as an elective for your students. So those are just a few examples of the kinds of things we can do in higher education, you know, to really make this pop. Very good. And uh, we have another good question from uh, uh, David Legg. Um, and he just asks, wants to know, Dr. Jim, are there other examples of this type of program happening globally? Um, so do you know of any uh, that's happening? Wow. Um, I think David wants, it in Canada. David wants it to come to Canada and other parts of the world. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, I'm sure there are. I, I, you really stumped me. I, I don't know. I mean, when I, when I typically try to create a program, the first thing I do is I think about what's not out there, you know, so, so that we're not overlapping. Because if there are people out there doing it, then, you know, I want to partner with them rather than, you know, recreate something that they've been so successful at. So, you know, I've, I've spent so much time in my own personal life with wellness that, you know, it finally was a revelation to me that, you know, we needed to go beyond exercise. And when I started to look at the literature, I was reading some really good articles about this, you know, holistic form of wellness, but nothing that was tailored to people with disabilities. So, uh, you know, there may be something out there, but I'm not aware of it. Definitely sounds very good. Uh, um, I'm trying to think so much are coming in. I, I might have actually, uh, kick it over to, to Eli just because there's uh, Sorry. Uh, yeah questions that are going on that are um, yeah there's a couple of questions, questions. Yeah, ahead, a lot. yeah no it's hard to see them all it's really great the conversation um, thank you all for engaging so much um, we have a great uh, question from Josh Sloan do you think wellness is something local adaptive sports clubs should be trying to incorporate into their offerings so kind of how do we integrate wellness even more into the adaptive sports community Yes. My personal feeling is that we should be incorporated into these sports programs. In fact, I did a presentation uh, a few weeks ago. Um, I actually taped a presentation that was shown at the conference in Ireland. I can't recall the name of it now. It was something about sports for, di for people with disabilities. And when they invited me to do one of the lectures, you know, I, I did ask them, I said, you know, is, is, is this for your sports programs? You know, they have these you know, these um, community-based sports programs. I said, is it for your group of people who are specialists in sport and recreation? And she said, yes. I said, well, you know, maybe, maybe mentors a little too broad because, you know, everybody's taxed with too much work. How would they add on something in wellness? And they took the complete opposite approach. They felt that, you know, once they knew that mentor was, you know, what it was, they said, this is something that we really want to start to build into our sports program. So I do see that when we go and look at the My Scorecard, there are several areas where we can kind of blend what we do in sport and recreation, you know, with what these mentor domains are all about. So for example, outdoor time in nature is, is you know, is a big area um, of the program. And, you know, outdoor time in nature is very simple, right? It's getting out into your parks and your recreation area. So there's an example of where there's an intersection, you know, with exercise, being outdoors, you know, moving more, being in nature, which is so health enhancing. In fact, there was a study that came out a couple of years ago that showed that people who are outdoors in nature, it could be parks, it could be a community garden, actually had a much lower death rate than people who were socially isolated. That's why I mentioned the point about Vivek Murthy because social isolation is, is, you know, really does take a huge hit on one's health. So being out in nature is an example of where these sports clubs could start to engage people, not only in the structured exercise, maybe competitive sport, but what are they doing, you know, on the weekends mm -hmm. or after that sports program? 
to make sure that they return to nature. And I'm a big believer in this whole area of mindfulness. And I think that's an area where, you know, they could be out walking in nature. And by the same token, they, be, they could be really, you know, I listen to, you know, to certain mindfulness tapes. So I'm getting a, I'm getting a double dose of being outdoor, physically moving, and really working on my mind to try to reduce the kinds of stress that we all kind of experience in our lives. Mm. Excellent, thank you. We do have uh, another question. Um, we're gonna go to Kwok's question shortly. Before that, I wanted to ask a question about mentoring overall. I know that, you know, just the overall mentoring movement, um, a lot of mentoring is focused on you know, a minority, racial, racial minority, ethnic, socioeconomic. There's also a lot of gender, you know, women's empowerment mentoring. Um, there's a national mentoring network. Um, January is actually National Mentoring Month. And so there's kind of this broader literature, broader work around mentoring. And uh, there are, there's a little bit in there on disability, you know, Partners for Youth with Disabilities. There's a National Disability Mentoring Coalition. Um, and so I'm wondering about kind of how this ties into that broader mentoring movement, if you will, and kind of the potential for it to be kind of really push it out there and really help the overall mentoring world. Yeah, it's a great question. You know, I really um, kind of funny here. I'll be fully, fully disclosed. I used mentor because it was a good acronym, you know, mindfulness, exercise, nutrition. And then I was thinking about it, you know, more from the perspective of, you know, flipping the mentor, we, we mentor you and then you mentor us. But I, I, I have not put an infrastructure of the kinds of skills that you are describing. And the power the of mentoring, the mentoring the movement. Yeah. That would I mean, it seems like it fits. It seems like it's a natural fit and so yeah. Yeah, because we don't, you know, that's, that's gonna be a good point is, you know, we, we, I talk a great line, right? That we want people with disabilities to become mentors. But when we get to that stage, you know, we have a 20 hour coaching program but it's not a coaching program to learn how to be a good mentor. It's a coaching program to learn the domains of wellness in mentor to provide to other participants. So that's a, you know, that's something that probably we need to think about offline because we do a little bit of motivational interview and training, but it's a very tiny smidgen. And I think when we do get to a point where people are starting to connect with this program, we're going to need some of that. Uh, yeah. We're going to need to have a dialogue with this group. Well, that could be interesting to kind of connect to that broader especially the, the National Disability Mentoring Coalition and then Mentoring National overall. So we had the question from Kwok is a great one. Um, I really like the aspect to go to self-run as the end line. Could you please share your thoughts on how, you, how could the APA specialist be trained to be there as support rather than what most APA professionals may be used to? So there's a, that's kind of a really interesting question about the role of the APA specialist. Um, yeah. Great question from Kwok. Thank you, Kwok. Yeah, thank you, Kwok. Yeah, I know, you know, I, I went through, you know, one of the best programs at that time, Texas Women's University, back in the late 70s, early 80s. And, you know, again, it was very heavily focused on the specialization of being a professional. That's what you do, you know, in, in, in the master's and undergrad. But I wonder, Kwok, if there's a place in the world of physical education and exercise where we could we could think more broadly about wellness without overstepping our boundaries coming from either a school of education. I, I'm in a school of health profession, so a wellness and disability class is something we'll be creating, um, you know, in our school probably within the next 12 to 13 months, and mentor will be a big part of that. But it is it is something I've struggled with in terms of, you know, can you start to make an adaptive physical activity professional you know, a bit more um, broader in training, you know, in the area of wellness, so that they can at least um, identify issues that may come up in, in the area of, of any of these wellness domains. And I think the answer is yes, you know, maybe the beginning point might be, you know, a course, a three credit course in wellness and disability. Um, there isn't a lot of research literature out there in wellness and disability, you'd have to piece it together. But I do think that mentor over time will start to collect some of that data on what people with disabilities are doing, what they're not doing, some of the issues they're having. And then, you know, this could become, you know, the training course or the training manual, manual for you. So we would be delighted to share it with anyone. And then maybe that's the beginning of 
adaptive physical activity and wellness. You know, we could add the and wellness, right? Because I, I, when, I, when I do the trainings, I make it perfectly clear, exercise is definitely our go-to. I mean, that is a core wellness domain, and it's, it's one of the critical, uh, one of the coaches at Boston, Elizabeth said a couple of days ago, she said, I consider it the big three, mindfulness, exercise, and nutrition. So maybe, you know, maybe we need to focus on the big tree and just go from exercise, which we do so well, and then just add a little bit of peace on mindfulness and a little bit of peace on, uh, on, on nutrition. And now at least you've got the three core wellness domains, the big three. And then from the big three, Quark, you could go into, you know, starting to build that out over time. But I do think that we need more coursework in adaptive physical activity and we've got to figure out a way to get wellness infused into it and the reason i bring that up is you know in public health you know they do have health promotion classes so if you're in a school of public health then it's probably more intuitive to do it because you could just offer an elective or try to build in a required program in wellness health promotion and disability i used to teach a course like that at the university of illinois chicago so i do think it's going to take a, a bit of a paradigm shift but I certainly see that there are opportunities to do that. I think it's important and incumbent upon us as professionals to not withhold any kind of wellness treatment that could improve the lives of people with disabilities. There's no question that exercise can do a lot, but it can't do everything. And there's no one out there that we can recommend who's gonna give them a specific wellness program in any of these domains that at least I'm aware of. Very good. Yeah, just a couple Jim. more. Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead, go ahead Eli. Oh. oh yeah, I was just gonna um, just uh, we have a couple more minutes. We may get a few more comments. Bob and I were just messaging back and forth that kind of with your history of the movement and reflecting on ADA thirty, but also to predict in the future, you know, in terms of how far we've come, but also where we're headed. Um, you know, it's such a great opportunity to have you to kind of share your thoughts. Um, kind of how far you think we've come, but also how much further we have to go and, and where we're headed toward the future. Maybe well, so. if you would have asked me in March. In, in two minutes. You have two minutes on that one. Okay. <laughs> well, I'm just going to give you an example. Don't take, you know, whatever my opinion is, is my opinion. Because if you would have asked me in March, you know, is the stock market going to go up this year or is it going to go down? Exactly. You know, I think Never I would have said, you know, there's a 99 out of 100 chance it's going to go down. And if it does go up, it's going to go up a percent. Of course, the stock market is, I think it's gone up like, I don't know, I want to say 100% from when it crashed in March. So <laughs> if that's any prediction, exactly. you know, I'm not the right person. But I would say that, you know, when you look on, it, if we can start to build a core of people with disabilities as our community, right? you know, from the bottom up, if we start to build this organically where people with disabilities become mentors and they grow the breadth and the scope of this program online and also on site, then my vision is, at least I hope my vision, you know, my dream would be that as I exit my profession, I would love to see a program of adaptive physical activity and wellness. I don't know if we May, you know, APAW probably need an acronym, but I do think that we need to take control uh, and, and be that warm handoff from rehabilitation. So in other words, somebody leaves a rehabilitation center, they've got a ton of things that are going on in their life. They've got to deal with finances. They've got to deal with their relationships. They've got to deal with the built environment. They've got to deal with getting, you know, good health care. They've got all of these, you know, new secondary health conditions, or they've got associated conditions with their head injury or their spinal cord injury, their stroke. So they've got a world of stuff that's going on. And here we are as exercise professionals, and we've got the skills. If we just branch this out, you know, giving them specific recommendations for nutrition, for exercise, getting them engaged in their community, maybe they get empowered to become a mentor coach. That's what my vision would be. I do think that as the profession of rehabilitation grows with the aging demographics, there's gonna to have to be a warm handoff to someone in the community. Now, who could that be? Well, if you look around, we've got tens of thousands of fitness centers, and I think those are gonna be the places, like I've mentioned in a number of occasions, where people could go to get more of broader wellness. And you're starting to see some of that in the YMCAs. But again, in the YMCAs, they're doing it 
you know, for a population that might have diabetes, what we're trying to do is make it more customized to someone who has diabetes and also has a spinal cord injury so that the customization fits perfectly with what we do as a profession, which is adapting activity, right? So if we just say adapted activity and wellness, right? Then the activity could be adapting relationship issues that people are having after an injury, adapting self-care skills for people who have bladder and bowel issues, adapting a spiritual practice for people who are really suffering because they've had this new event. They, un they don't understand why it happened to them. They're very upset, they're angry. You know, if we could start to adapt it and build it from the ground up with the disability community telling us what they want and what they don't want. You know, one more final comment, I'll quit, but I was reading a, a, a phenomenal article that came out in the New York Times. The New York Times has a section on disability. And I, uh, there was a woman who had written a story. Uh, she's an artist and she paints people uh, who have disabilities. She sketches people and she talked about how she was doing this now through Zoom. Uh, an amazing artist and she described that she went through seven she has spina bifida and she said she, in her lifetime she went and had 70 surgeries and after each surgery there was an event you know she wasn't able to move a certain body part something else didn't work you know she needed certain adaptations and accommodations so i see us as the warm handoff for the medical rehabilitation community. Somewhere, somebody has to leave that hospital and be supported by someone like us. And we know how to support people because there's not a profession on the, on the face of the earth that has done more to support the needs of people with disabilities in an inclusion model than we have in adaptive physical activity. Outstanding, Dr. Jim, uh, as always. Um, one more final one, not gonna get, let you get away that easily just quickly it's it's kind of a little bit personal um but with all the wealth of information and an outstanding living legendary career what is the one thing that you would say you'd hang your hat on has been a, a great accomplishment uh, the epitome of your work uh, the things you're most proud of outside of your, your lovely wife diane and your two girls what it motivates you or gets you going and gets you up in the morning to, to go through those 1500 emails with your hot coffee there next to you after you've ran seven miles? <laughs> wow. Well, I know we only, we only have a minute, but I, I, you know, I would say personally, just like everybody, I think everybody on this call would say the same thing. I think it's social justice. As a kid growing up in the New York City housing project, Pominock and Flushing, Queens, the social injustices for me at that early stage of my life, when everybody was out participating in stickball and handball and stoopball, and there were certain children in my neighborhood that weren't, it, it was built in my DNA at that point that we need a society that's more inclusive, and there's no better way to do this than the wellness and sports. And the kind of work that we do, and I know that Lauren Lieberman would support this, Jeff McCubbin, Manny Felix, and those of you on the call, is what we do in adaptive physical activity is we focus on inclusion. You know, we don't focus on the medical etiology or something dealing with spasticity. We focus on how do we improve that spasticity through a quality physical activity program. So I think that's what we're all about, Bob, is we're a family, we're a very small family, but we're working together to eliminate what we have seen in our society as a deeply pervasive social injustice. Because if someone cannot get access to wellness or to exercise, that's something that I can't sleep with. So I have an example, just one example of a woman. She lives in Center Point. She had a, cere uh, she had a, a spinal cord injury stroke. She was paralyzed from the neck down. She's an African-American woman living in Center Point, And she's living in a bed. She doesn't get out very much. And they had to reconvert the garage into her home because she couldn't get up you know, stairs. I pray for her every day, and I hope that before I step off the stage, that the least we could do for her is to put windows into the basement where she lives, get an apiary where she could look outside and see beautiful trees and flowers in nature, and then get her you know, out into the community so that she could participate in wellness, something in outdoors in nature, or maybe you know somebody you know, just meets with her. My goal is to meet with her someday at Red Mountain and just sit with her for an hour, you know, in a beautiful park. So as long, you know, 
Every day when I get up, I think of Erica. The first thing I think about, the first person I pray for is her because she is a microcosm of the social injustices that we have in our society. No one should be living in the dark basement, completely, completely isolated from the rest of the world. That's what keeps me going. And that's what will keep me going until the day I die. And I know, it will be, I know it's the same for all of you. So thank you for that question. Well, thank you, Dr. Jim. And uh, this was outstanding, great session. And, and actually just a little pinpoint real quickly, this whole idea of what Eli and I are doing along with David Legg and, and Kristen Orr and, and these 88 chats were kind of inspired by Dr. Jim. Every time I'd see Dr. Jim, he'd look at me and he goes, hey, Bob, what's new? And it was like, wow, what a, what a nice catchphrase. What's new? Uh, and it's from that, I shared it with Eli and with his great mind. And these, these 88 chats came up. So you definitely are inspiring us, Dr. Jim, and, and keeping us motivated. So uh, with that, Eli, do you have any closing thoughts? Okay. No, no, thank you. I just thank want you to so thank everyone to... who's part of our yeah, thank center. You. Um, if I could just jump in, because Bob, you've been fantastic to me. Bob and I went to Israel in 2015. Eli was there. We had a phenomenal time. So, um, you know, I just thank you guys because I learn a lot from you. And what I learn, I put into my spirit. And hopefully I'll be able to share that, you know, with the people like Erica that I, 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 I hope we can, you know, reach, you know, before I pass. Definitely. Oh, we are and we will. Wonderful. And there's still more to come, Dr. Jim. So, uh, yeah. so on behalf of uh, Eli and myself, and, and uh, thank all our sponsors and, and Dr. Jim, uh, Merry Christmas, Happy New Year, Happy Hanukkah, and Happy Holidays to all our listeners. And uh, this uh, recording will be uh, on the NICPAD website and our social media site. So uh, thank you very much. And uh, yeah. we'll talk to you all again. Take care. Thanks so much, everyone. Thank you. See ya. Close out. Yeah, that was great. Thanks so much. Wow, that was outstanding. <laughs> That's, yeah. I mean, I, he could literally talk all day, and, <laughs> and you just want yeah. to hear more. So, <laughs> good stuff. Uh, all right, yes, well, thanks, Bob. All right, no, thank you, brother. Uh, we'll yeah, that was awesome. Yeah, I, we'll I, I know. It, yeah, just real quickly, I know.